Welcome to the Sustainable Packaging Podcast. I'm Corey Connors, and today my very special guest is Mr. Andy Kurtz from Buttermilk Creative. He's the creative director. He's also the email marketing coordinator for Startup CPG and a mentor at SKU. Welcome, sir. How are you? Thanks for having me, Corey. I'm doing great. Good. And that's quite a few jobs. Uh, these are all three your current roles. Tell me, tell me more about that. Sure. So buttermilk creative is is uh, no pun intended our bread and butter. It's <laughs> you know what I what what we've been doing for six years now. After I, I left my my corporate job, I'm working in house at a, a specialty grocery store called the Fresh Market, and so that's really where I spend most of my day. And you know, obviously working with clients, designing packaging and branding and things like that. And then with the email coordinator with Startup CPG, I sort of fell into that role or, or I, I volunteered myself for that role, not really knowing what it entailed. I just, there was a need and I said, okay, let's do it. But, you know, I, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings are pretty much consumed by pulling together their email of, you know, if there's the upcoming clubhouse or announcements or blog content or their podcast and just send it out to the community. And what's been really neat about it is that being a creative director, I'm sort of removed from a lot of the, I don't know, like the, the minutia of projects. And for that, I get to wear a different hat, which is just like, you know, copy and paste some stuff, do some production type of stuff, maybe create a graphic or something. And so it's been sort of fun to do sort of that, that sort of task work. I don't know. It just, it, you know, when you spend a lot of time doing sort of more high level stuff, it's fun to do sort of that. I don't want to say lower level, but, you know, just more production type of stuff. Different, and then, very different, right? Yes. <laughs> and then with, with SKU, that is intense, but it's, it's for a certain amount of time. So their, their curriculum lasts about 11, 11 or 13 weeks, I think. And really, yes, it's, they tell you, you know, you need to set aside about four hours a week for wow. your mentoring duties. I probably, because I wanted to learn as much as I could, because this was my first track, I wanted to learn as much as I could from each class. So I would spend about, you know, the afternoon of Tuesday, Tuesdays was, were class days, and then Fridays were our get together with our particular team and go over stuff. And that was about, you know, two or three hours on Fridays. So, you know, all said, I, I probably spent about seven hours a week on it. But, you know, it was, it's such a great program. And I actually signed up to be a mentor on their other program called Imp Impact SKU, which wow. it, it looks just like regular SKU, except accelerator program, except it's more impact means more like socially impact companies or environmental impact companies. So companies that have, you know, that in their mission. So I'm excited. That's starting up soon. So I'm excited to be, get back into the swing of things and it won't be as, I don't think I'll spend as much, be able to spend as much time on it just because I'm familiar with the curriculum, but, but yeah, no, it's, it, I don't know. Like I've, I felt like obviously with everyone else, the, with the pandemic and just all the overwhelming stuff, I found myself putting more things on my plate just to, I don't know, I'd feel a little burnt out, you know, with like day-to-day -day stuff. And it was just neat to sort of like get in, put my, you know, get into these other things that, I don't know, keep things interesting. <laughs> I think that's very true. I think we've all, you know, when you're not commuting for an hour a day, all of a sudden you have extra time. And sure. uh, like you said, the monotony of one job, you know, can, can lead to an itch for, for, for more or different. And, you know, that's a big reason I started this podcast. So that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, and there was a huge demand for it. People wanted to, to, to learn about sustainable packaging and how to be sustainable. But I'd love to hear just a little bit about your background. How did, how did you get into the creative space as a designer? Sure. So I, from an early age, like from, you know, I'm one of those, you know, cliche stories of as long as I could remember, I, I, I drew and, and I was lucky enough to be able to be enrolled in some sort of art class from like sixth grade on. And as I got closer to graduating high school, we have this great uh, vocational 
school here that you travel to from your main school. Right. And, and I was able to spend, it's called, now it's called Weaver Academy, but I was able to spend most of my day in my junior and senior years at Weaver doing computer science, computer graphics classes, illustrator classes, Photoshop classes, photography classes. So yeah, I just, as soon as some kind of required course got off my plate, like math, I was, <laughs> I was signing up for whatever creative thing I could do. And so then that led me to, I just knew, I knew I wanted to do something in art. And so I bounced around a little bit until I found a home down in Ringling College of Art and Design down in Sarasota. And I studied illustration down there, uh, but they're so, they're good at creating well-rounded students. So we were exposed to design and layout and fine arts. So we, we, so that's really where I was able to graduate there with a good uh, handle on, on all, pretty much all the practices. And so from there, we were, in, we'd stayed in Florida for, we being my wife and I stayed in Florida for a little bit. And then I landed at, we moved back here to North Carolina and started working at the corporate offices of the Fresh Market. And they just had a design job opening and I applied to it and got it. And I had no idea what that entailed. I'd worked at a print shop designing all their stuff down in Florida you know, just for random clients and stuff. So I really didn't know what an in-house designer did at the time. And I don't think hardly anybody did. This was before in-house was a big thing. Yeah. And so I was there for seven years and just fell in love with the, the, the specialty food world and, and just the, and also we did a lot of their private brand packaging design, you know? And so just this, this thing that I designed now is on the shelves of over 200 stores, you know, and that was just, yeah. it was cool. I could, I could tell family in Alabama and in Florida, you guys can go pick up my work at <laughs> your local fresh market, you know, and it's a really neat feeling. And, and we did a ton of other work. It was just great preparation for working with a variety of different personalities with our clients, because, you know, as an in-house designer, you work, you're every, We'd like to say, we, we would say that we have over 200 clients because, you know, each from the marketing specialist to the CEO can request a project from you. So you have to know how to work with all these different types of personalities and people. And, and so that prepared me to work with, you know, founders and, 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 you know, CEOs of all these different companies and just our clients in general or marketing directors or whoever you know, we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I was there for seven years. And then just through that, like I said, falling in love with that, that, that world, I knew I wanted to do what I did for the fresh market, but just with our own clients. So started Buttermilk Creative six years ago, six years and some change. It was in January of 2015. And, and just, you know, started work in our network. That was the neat thing about the fresh market is that a lot of connections with brands, but then also the buyers that in category managers that we, we knew left and went to other places. And so, you know, just sort of, you know, made the rounds and, and have just built a client base of, uh, of, you know, specialty food and beverage folks. So yeah, that's, that's sort of how I got to where I am now. <laughs> that's fantastic. And I, I really like your story about when you were in-house working with 200 different types of people yeah. or literally 200 people, how everybody has their own perspective yeah, and, and how everybody has their own priorities. And so you get to, to cut your teeth on learning from everyone. And yeah. then as a, and now you've got your own agency and you've got, you can pull in all those 200 perspectives and say, well, this part of packaging is important to so-and-so. Yep. Or we should talk, have you thought about this type of thing? And have you discussed it with logistics? Because we got to put it on a pallet. And you know, yep. so I think that makes you so valuable. That experience is huge. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so funny when you're in that day-to-day -day, and with any job, even with running Buttermilk Creative, you get, you, you, you know, you get sort of, you know, down on it sometimes. And especially in that sort of cube world, you know, you just sort of feel like, what am I doing here? You know? And like, but in hindsight, I'm like, no, that was, 
That was exactly where I needed to be. It prepared me for what we're doing now. It gave me all this insight into the space where our clients are. And it's just, it, and, and even from the perspective of being able to work day to day with grocery buyers and seeing how they made their decisions and, and being in category review meetings and cuttings and samplings and hearing how they would respond to their, to the packaging. Like, you know, if, if something arrived in the mail room, which was, you know, the shipper was beautifully designed and this was even before like e-commerce was really big and stuff. If it arrived and it was really neat, it would get shared around the office. And so you better believe that brand had a really good chance of getting on shelf because everybody saw it, everybody oogled over it. And, and, but then if they followed through on their packaging, the, the, the product packaging and it was compliant and it was shelf ready, then yes, that, and it, you know, obviously they would go negotiate, make the numbers work, but if all that stuff happened, they had a fighting chance versus the, the, you know, just the random, you know, brown box with some, you know, paper stuffed in there, you know, with a label slapped on it. If it's an amazing product, maybe, but probably not. Right. So I'm asking everyone this big question, and I'd love to know your thoughts. Can packaging be sustainable? <laughs> I have to think yes. And, it, you know, I've really, it's interesting. I was on a, on a clubhouse the other day and we were talking a lot, or, you know, the, the folks were talking about, the, the speakers were talking about compostable and someone came on and they were like, folks, it's, this is, the goal is not to make more waste. Just because the waste takes, is, is, dissipates quicker doesn't mean that it solves a problem. It's really about reusability. And so that really made me think, because I push our clients to like, have you looked at compostable? Have you looked at, you know, how, how, you know why are we using this plastic? Da, 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 da. It, it made me really think about like, you know, I haven't really looked at reusable packaging options. And, and so, you know, stuff, packaging has to be, happen. We can't just like have products sitting open on the shelf. <laughs> so, so, so we have to have it. There's no real way around it. But yes, I think it can be sustainable. There's way more tech out there and stuff that I don't understand that can can bring that to reality. But but yeah, I think it can be, and it has to be. That is awesome answer. I I totally agree. And um, only one person so far has said no. <laughs> so uh, that has been my guest, and um, <laughs> she's she's brilliant. So I I, I respect her opinion. I mean, yeah, it yeah. takes all viewpoints. Yeah, like uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here was from a design perspective. Can you give other designers or other companies any tips on how to be sustainable? What kinds of things should they be looking out for? I think they should be looking at their, we, a, a lot of companies, and I, I know that it's, it's hard because especially if you're a slightly older company, you have likely designed your, your um, production line around a certain type of, type of, you know, format. And so to ask that person to no, you should rethink all that and reinvest the $50,000 or whatever you paid for that line machine or whatever is a big, that's, that's big. And I did that, that the weight of that isn't lost on me, but I do think that we probably are thinking we're probably stuck. Some of us are stuck in like a, well, we've always done it that way. Right. And not really reassessing and looking at, well, what, what if we use the same machinery, but we replace uh, what we're currently using with this material or something, you know? And so I think it's just going to take a lot of creativity and, and really questioning the status quo of where we're at right now. And to the extent that designers can do that, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, you know, our job is not to like a, a, a true, like visual packaging designer is not really, our, our role is not to, to, to sort of dictate what that structure is. It's likely we, we get the structure, we get the die line, and then we wrap beautiful design around it. We're happy to like weigh in and sort of help the client think through 
what that says about the brand, but we really don't, that's a structural engineer, you know, that really is going to create that form. But what we can do is we can just ask the question and say, have you thought about it? And, and like, you know, there's, there are an, there's an ever growing list, lists, resource of, of places to go to research these materials and things like that. So it's, you know, even a year ago, it was hard to, I think there was maybe one, one sort of group pulling together a resource list, comprehensive resource list of sustainable materials. Yeah. And now I know of at least 10 off the top of my head that are doing it. And that's awesome. And there's, and it's just neat that there's so many out there. And so, you know, it's like, before we could just say like, hey, have you thought about this? What if now we can say, have you thought about this? And oh, by the way, here, here's either just this list that you can comb through or based on what you've said, here's what I'd recommend. Boom, boom, boom. Right. I love that. And you're right. We have come so far. I mean, I started uh, 19 years ago at, at Landsberg and to see what we're doing now in regards to sustainability yeah. is leaps and bounds of in front of where we were. And it's very exciting. It's very, I think, commendable that packaging companies and brands are making the efforts. They're really trying. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You mentioned reusable packaging, and that's something that's very interesting to me right now. Do you think that's the future or do you think it's just part of the future of packaging? I think, uh, I think it's part of it. There's just going to have to be such a, like a societal change in how we use things to, to, to make it, you know, adopted, widely adopted. And I guess I just, on one hand, I think it's, it's amazing. There's this one soap brand who I met the, the founder, Jason, and he makes, it's called Petal. And, you know, it's, it's, the first order ships, in, you know, and you've got this little stainless, I think it's stainless little uh, pump. And then there's a little like almost like Tide Pod basically that dissolves and you fill it with water, you shake it and there's your hand soap for however long. And which is really neat because now future shipments are just these little pods, you know? So it's, right. you know, he's really done a great job of, of really trying to, to limit the impact. But I guess my worry is, all the folks that are going to buy that maybe because it's cool or maybe because the, they just needed some soap and they toss it afterwards, you know, like how, how do we get people to really adopt this idea? And so you can sort of think about that and see how that might, how that might happen with deodorants and all these other things, you know, and like, so I think it's very cool that I see these big brands doing this, but I, I, I hope that there's also an education component to really driving home, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a reason to reorder, you know, helping people through, you know, getting them discounts and things like that to really drive those, that, that thinking. Right. I totally agree. I, we use a similar product in my house and uh, we've totally adopted the change, but it did take a lot of effort mm -hmm. to, to just like, you know, stop buying the old plastic versions, but reusing the old plastic versions with the same tablets. Yes. Uh, so that's something that we've figured out works really well. And so you don't always have to buy the really nice stainless yeah. steel or glass dispensers for your packaging. You can um, reuse old plastics for, yes. you know, a long time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's I like that idea. I think, I don't know what they call that refillable, I guess would be yeah. the, the sense of, or in the condensed, the concentrated, uh, the concentrated yeah. tablets are, I think you're right. I think we should stop shipping water to each other. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, that's ex essentially what we're doing. Yeah. 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 We have it. It's in the, I mean, thankfully most of us have it and and, and yeah, like you're, you're dead on, you know, like if you really frame it that way, I think people would be like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm paying like, or, you know, even if you get it free shipping from prime, you're paying for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it's heavier for the truck and it's, you know, more energy 
for the factory. And, you know, there's all of these things that just make it less sustainable when, when, like you said, most people, and we're blessed to have a water tap, have a water tap at their home uh, or near their home and they could fill it up. Yeah. And, and I love, and, love that. I like the, I like the, the idea of customization too, you know, so like we can really control how, you know, liquidy we want our soap or how, or in it, then that applies to other things like powdered almond milk or other, other things that you can put down into a powder or concentrate. You can now mix and match control. So it gives a level of customization that, that we didn't necessarily have before too. You can drop in essential oils or whatever, you know, it's just, yeah. I like that a lot. And I've seen that for cleaning products. A lot of people in the sustainability rooms on, on Clubhouse, we've, we've talked about that a few times. So to be clear with the audience, that's where you and I met is mm -hmm. on the Clubhouse app. And that's an audio-based social media, I guess. You know, I guess you would call it that. But it's basically rooms of people talking about a topic and they're live. So it's a, it's a great app. I highly recommend anybody to check out Clubhouse. And it's now available for all cell phones for the first year or however long. I'm not sure how long it's been around, but it was only available for Apple. Correct. Yep. So it's good to see the, uh, the rest of the people showing up as well. <laughs> for sure. So yeah, thank you so much for your time today, Andy. What's the best way for us to get a hold of you and your, your companies? Sure. So buttermilkcreative.com is where you can see our work and connect with us on our website. And then I, I strongly urge uh, anyone who's working at a star, Starbucks, working at a startup or, <laughs> or is in a company of one to five people to join the startup CPG Slack group at startupcpg or yeah startupcpg.com and then yeah as far as skew goes it's an incredible program if if anything just go to skew.is and just look at the their alumni and watch the old showcase videos and just be inspired by all these great founders so is skew a a person to person mentoring or is it more of a business if i was a business owner i would come to to skew. Yeah. So it's you, you, a business. So it's basically a accelerator program and it was, it is out of, it started in Austin and the main program is still in Austin because that's just such a hub for startups and CBG and all that. that. Yeah. Yeah. And so now they've branched out to other cities like Dallas, Fort Worth and New York city and Minneapolis and, 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 Basically what it is, is there's a, you as the company apply for the program and then through, there's a screening process and everything out of that comes about, I think about seven companies in the cohort. Those seven wow. companies basically get assigned a group of mentors and it's, it's like the mentor team that I was on had the former CEO, current I think it, he was the, he was the, he was the former CEO of Stubbs and now he's the current CEO of Rhythm Superfoods. There was the CMO of Vital Farms. There was, God, who else was there? I mean, it was just, it was just crazy to see these like brands and companies that, that in people that I, I knew from, I don't know, like seeing them speak at a, at, you know, one of the trade show food shows or whatever or being highlighted on a podcast or something to now just on a weekly basis, I'm in a call with them and we're all sort of contributing because they have amazing intuition and background and everything. But the, what I wanted to bring to SKU was, which I didn't necessarily see, they have branding and packaging folks in the mentor group, but I felt like there could be more, you know, and I had with my retail background, I could bring a little bit more to the table and so that's really what I wanted to do. And I just, you know, I was starstruck, obviously. But once we got into the rhythm of the, the, the team meetings, I was like, no, I'm just like they can talk P&Ls and, you know, what are what is your slotting fees and all this kind of stuff. I can talk about design and, and brand and things like that, that 
obviously they know because they're they they've created great brands and all that kind of stuff but i still felt like i had a unique viewpoint that i could bring to the table but yeah no that's that's a long way of saying it's an accelerator program that launched or you know helped launch what we know now is Siete Foods and Epic Bar and gosh, I mean, it's just their list of alumni is, it's crazy. That's fantastic. And, and like you said, we all need to contribute from our perspective and uh, help from our perspective and listen from their perspective, you know, and work together to, to make great companies and, and be sustainable together. This is really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andy. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Corey. It has been a pleasure. And anytime you want me back, I'm happy to sit here and, 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 and gab. (laughs) I would love that. Yeah. We'll do that again. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.